Welcome, everybody. It is so good to have you all here. It is so good to have you all joining us on our Zoom webinar. We're going to give everybody just a second to get into the Zoom room, and then we'll be getting started in just a minute. Um, welcome, everybody, in, in the room here at 1300 Locust Street in Center City, Philadelphia. Uh, my name is Justina Barrett, and I am the Director of Education and Programs here at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. HSP was founded in 1824, and we proudly serve as Philadelphia's Library of American History. We have some amazing collections here at 1300 Locust Street, treasures like the first and second handwritten drafts of the U.S. Constitution. We also have William Still's Journal C, the handwritten document in which he was receiving people escaping freedom from the South in the 1850s. But we also have a broad and diverse collection of um, documents, manuscripts, scripts and graphic items that tell the story of all Americans. Uh, we have documents that help genealogists find their family histories. We have documents that tell medical and scientific and business history. We have documents that talk about the founding of Pennsylvania as well as the founding of the nation. And I'm so excited to have uh, our speaker here today to bring us right up to uh, a current exhibition that is going on at our friends over at the Museum of the American Revolution. I'm going to now uh, introduce Matt Skick. He is a curator of Black Founders, the Fortin family of Philadelphia. That is on view from now until November 26th. So you still have a good solid two months to get over to Third Street to see this exhibition. Uh, Matt joined the curatorial staff at the Museum of the American Revolution in 2016 after graduating from the Winter Tour Program in Early American Culture at the University of Delaware. Uh, since the museum's opening in 2017, he has curated multiple award-winning exhibitions, including Hamilton Was Here, Rising Up in Revolutionary Philadelphia, and Cost of Revolution, The Life and Death of an Irish Soldier, in addition to Black Founders, the Fortin family of Philadelphia. Uh, before we invite you up to the stage, Matt, I just want to go over a few housekeeping rules. Uh, you all are on webinar mode, and that means you cannot um, see each other and we cannot see you. We are going to ask that you uh, put any questions that you want answered by Matt uh, into the Q&A, and we'll be able to answer them at, at the end of the program. Uh, there is closed captioning available, and if you need that, you can hit the CC button down on your Zoom bar. And we are also recording this. So we will be sending a recording of this out to everybody who registered for the program. Um, so if, you know, if, if life happens and the cat knocks over your modem, you'll be able to see the rest of this talk. Um, so thank you again for joining us. Uh, thank you to everybody in the room who is here to hear uh, Matt talk about the amazing exhibition and the documents and the objects that made it happen. Matt, do you wanna come up? Thank you very much, uh, Justina and, and David and, and Selena for inviting me to give this talk here and really build upon uh, uh, the relationship between the Museum of the American Revolution and the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. And uh, as Justina said, this uh, Black Founders exhibition is very much a, a, an outgrowth of that, that relationship. And we're, we're very pleased to be able to, uh, to share this story of the Fortin family with a, a wider audience. And um, the story of uh, James Fortin has been shared at the Museum of the American Revolution as part of its daily programming since the museum opened in, in, uh, to the public in 2017. Uh, as part of our display of a recreation of a privateer uh, ship in our War at Sea uh, gallery, uh, visitors uh, can learn about James Fortin and his experience as a, a sailor aboard a privateer ship during the Revolutionary War, something he did when he was just a teenager, signing up at the age of 14. And uh, an outgrowth of that has also been a first person theatrical performance that was developed uh, uh, by the museum uh, alongside uh, local uh, playwrights and a local actor named uh, Nathan Alfred Tate. That is, uh, has been a popular way of uh, learning about James Fortin's story. And so when uh, the Museum of the American Revolution was considering its uh, exhibition, special exhibitions plan, uh, 
the Fortin story was rising to the top because oftentimes our special exhibits pull a thread on a story that we share in our, our main gallery, our core exhibition. And uh, these special exhibits pull that thread and go deeper, give deeper dives into stories uh, uh, that, that, that we share on a daily basis. And the Fortin story is one of those. Uh, now, uh, James Fortin uh, is probably a recognizable name to many of you, but not, not everybody. And uh, we'll get to uh, a deeper dive into this uh, portrait a little bit later on. But uh, James Fortin was born free here in Philadelphia in 1766 uh, in the uh, neighborhood not too far away from where the Museum of the American Revolution is, is today. And uh, he uh, came of age in the revolutionary uh, era. He's a teenager during the Revolutionary War, but at the age of nine, he had an experience that was pretty, uh, made a pretty profound impact on him. He was there for the first public reading of the Declaration of Independence on uh, July 8th, 1776, in the yard of the Pennsylvania State House or, or Independence Hall. And so uh, when James Fortin uh, signs up to serve aboard a uh, privateer ship in 1781, uh, he's doing so as, as a teenager, he's risking his life but, the, but putting his support behind this new idea of the United States of America. Uh, James Fortin's voyage aboard that privateer ship called the Royal Lewis is successful initially, but then the second voyage, he becomes a prisoner of war of the British, survives that experience, spending seven months as a prisoner of war, comes back to Philadelphia, apprentices uh, to a leading sailmaker in the city, someone his father had worked for, that man's name was Robert Bridges, and James Fortin rises in the ranks in Bridges' sailmaking shop, which employed an integrated workforce. And uh, Fortin becomes uh, Robert Bridges' right-hand man, so much so that when Bridges is seeking to retire from the sailmaking business, he actually gives the business to James Fortin. And Fortin leads that business from 1798 until 1842, uh, when, he, when he passes away, almost 45 years. And Fortin builds that uh, business to become uh, and he himself becomes the wealthiest African-American person in Philadelphia in the early 19th century, and perhaps the entire nation during that period. But the Fortin um, story doesn't end there. It, it, it blossomed into Fortin's energy and efforts uh, into reforming the nation. And that's what this exhibit is, is all about. It's tell, sharing that story, but not just James Fortin's role in that, but his uh, wife, Charlotte, his children, and then his grandchildren, three generation, generations of one family, 100 years of time, uh, and their efforts in uh, abolition, uh, civil rights, uh, and also being community leaders of the free black community here in Philadelphia. And so the uh, exhibition takes visitors on that journey from July 8, 1776, through James Fortin's service as a privateer uh, uh, during the Revolutionary War. We uh, commissioned a scale model of the ship that James Fortin served aboard uh, uh, by a, this is a model that was created by a ship model builder named Rex Stewart based in Albany, New York. We re recreated a portion of James Fortin's sail loft as a hands-on educational space to learn about the work that uh, James Fortin was involved in on a, on a daily basis. We uh, brought together uh, uh, documents and, and items connected to uh, the free black community in Philadelphia that, that the Fortin family was very much a, a leader of and major contributor to. We brought together objects on loan from living descendants of James Fortin who are now spread throughout the country. We'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, but some of these objects have been on display now for the very first time in a, in a public exhibition. Uh, this exhibit goes uh, into the Civil War period after James Fortin's death, but his children and grandchildren are, are uh, putting their, their weight behind the cause of the United States uh, and, and uh, in both military capacities and also in recruitment and supporting freedom seekers and also um, uh, recently freed people uh, who had uh, just transitioned from slavery to freedom. But this work is built upon decades of scholarship. Uh, not only is it uh, this exhibit representing some of the new work that the Museum of the American Revolution has done, but also the work of historians, many of whom have spent 
quite a bit of time here in uh, working at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania and working with documents. These include Erica Armstrong Dunbar, Julie Winch, Janice Sumler Edmond, Richard uh, Newman. Uh, these are, uh, and of course, Gary Nash. Uh, this, these are major contributors to scholarship on uh, African-American history of the early 19th century. And they definitely are laying the foundation and had many major contributions to make this, an exhibit like this possible. But one of the things that uh, we set about going, uh, we set ourselves to is sort of reassembling the material world of the Fortin family. Uh, that included uh, assembling documents, works of art, uh, uh, three-dimensional objects, artifacts that are directly connected to the family or made, used, owned by people that were in their, their circles, in their networks, people that knew them, people that um, uh, interacted with the Fortins on a, on a daily basis and joined in their causes. And what this led to was working with 40 different lenders from across the country. And this map gives you uh, the sense of where these lenders uh, are, are located, where they, where they uh, were sending uh, objects from. And we assembled about 100 objects works of art, documents, uh, some coming as far away as the United Kingdom, some from uh, uh, Central Michigan University uh, up, up there in Northern Michigan, uh, but also up and down the East Coast from Boston uh, down to uh, Colonial Williamsburg. But uh, of course, one of the, the, the largest lender to this uh, exhibition is the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. So very, very much appreciative of that. So we're gonna get into that in a second, but the, some of the uh, uh, objects and documents that I wanted to highlight here that comes from some of the other lenders are uh, uh, part of this effort of reassembling that material world. This is one of my favorites, and it's uh, uh, actually the original letter of mark or the license that was granted to the, uh, the captain of the Royal Lewis, Stephen Decatur, father of the more famous Stephen Decatur. Um, he was the captain of James Fortin's ship, but this is the original letter of mark that uh, Captain Decatur received from the Continental Congress in July of 1781, authorizing him uh, to sail on the Royal Lewis on behalf of the United States and attack enemy vessels, British vessels. And so um, when the Royal Lewis was captured, this uh, paper was aboard the ship and was actually captured by the British. So it actually ended up in the National Archives of the United Kingdom. Uh, and this is, this exhibit is the very first time that this document has ever been back in the United States since it was issued in 1781. So um, uh, it's been tucked away in, in England, not, hasn't received much, much attention, but we're able to uh, bring it uh, back to the United States for the very, very first time since the Revolutionary War. Uh, alongside it from the uh, uh, National Archives of the United Kingdom is the, uh, the muster book or the, um, the ledger that documents the prisoners of, of war that were aboard the prison ship Jersey, which James Fortin was aboard. And you can see his name uh, listed there, pointed out with that the purple arrow, James Fortune. And there, you can see the notation for Royal Lewis uh, there on, on the ledger as well. Again, this is the first time this document is back in the United States since the Revolutionary War. There's a, only a handful of surviving business records from James Fortin's uh, sale uh, making business a handful of which survive in the Independent Seaport Museum just across town. We were able to bring together original sailmaking tools. These were found in a British shipwreck uh, from it that, was, that sank off the coast of Delaware in 1798, the same year that James Fortin took over the sail loft. So giving uh, uh, visitors a sense of the types of tools that James Fortin worked with. There's only one surviving image of James Fortin's wife, Charlotte Van Dyne Fortin, and that's a photograph that was taken here in Philadelphia in the 1860s. That's now part of the collection of the Moreland Spingarn Research Center at Howard University. Um, a contemporary of James Fortin's was Richard Allen, so a, a generation older than, uh, than, than Fortin, but uh, Allen was, um, uh, was knew James Fortin well, uh, Fortin was uh, frequently present at uh, meetings of the black community uh, in at uh, Bethel AME Church. Now we know his mother Bethel AME Church. Another contemporary of James Fortin was William Whipper. This wonderful portrait of him is from the Fenimore Museum of Art uh, in Cooperstown, New York. 
Uh, and uh, William Whipper, a generation younger than James Fortin, joined with Fortin to form the American Moral Reform Society in the 1840s, excuse me, 1830s, just before James Fortin's death. And as I mentioned previously, James Fortin's uh, children and grandchildren are supportive of the United States effort during the Civil War. And um, James Fortin's uh, second oldest son, Robert Bridges Fortin, enlisted in the 43rd Regiment of United States Colored Troops and trained at Camp William Penn in 1864. Uh, Robert Bridges Fortin, though, at that time was 50 years old. Uh, this, and he became the senior most enlisted man of that regiment uh, as the Sergeant Major of the regiment. And although the 43rd uh, Regiment's flag that they carried in battle in 1864 no longer survives, one of the 11 flags that was made, uh, painted by David Bustle Bowser, African-American artist here in Philadelphia, only one of the flags that he made for the 11 regiments that trained at Camp William Penn still survives. And that's this one for the 127th USCT. It was uh, recently sold out of uh, the collection of the Grand Army of the Republic Museum here in Philadelphia. Uh, but is now part of the collection of the Atlanta History Center. It's made a brief return to Philadelphia as part of this exhibition. Uh, Robert Bridges Fortin's daughter, Charlotte Fortin, uh, was, uh, while her father was serving in the U USCT, she was down in South Carolina as part of a relief effort to help support uh, recently freed um, um, African Americans who um, had grown up at living in enslaved, and now they are considered free people in union occupied territory. Charlotte Fortin is um, helping them with education, religious instruction, uh, and she writes a journal about her experience. And that journal has been edited and published before as the journals of Charlotte Fortin Grimke, perhaps you've encountered it before, but her original journals are in the collection of Howard University. And so her journal from 1863 is on loan to the exhibit and on display. She writes about meeting the 54th Massachusetts Regiment just before their attack on Fort Wagner. Uh, and uh, she, she mentions um, meeting Robert Gould Shaw and writes about her everyday experiences of being down there as the only um, uh, African-American woman as part of this relief effort that came from Philadelphia to go down to South Carolina to do this work. But of course, we also did a lot of mining uh, for the uh, collections here at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. Of course, the, 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 the headline image of the exhibit is the portrait of uh, James Fortin, or I should say that is believed to be of James Fortin. It's a unsigned, uh, undated, uh, un, uh, un, not quite positively identified as Fortin, but it's all the signs are pointing to that this is, is very likely him. Um, this is painted in, painted in about uh, the 18, early 1820s, perhaps the 1830s, uh, but it's a, a, a small uh, portrait. And many of you have probably seen this image uh, before. Uh, for those of you that it's, it's new, it appears on the first scholarly biography of James Fortin, A Gentleman of Color by Julie Winch. But few people have seen it uh, in its full form. Uh, this is actually uh, a work on paper uh, and you can see that the artist uh, uh, painted it to fill the, uh, the center of this, this sheet of paper uh, and uh, so that it could be possibly framed. Uh, and then uh, one of the uh, uh, projects that came about as a result of this loan is that we worked with the Historical Society of Pennsylvania to sponsor the conservation of uh, and treatment of this uh, portrait at the Center for Conservation of Art and Historic Artifacts uh, here in Philadelphia. So here we see uh, uh, one of the conservators' uh, photographs of the, the paint, uh, uh, really delicate paint uh, on the, uh, on the substrate, substrate here, uh, right uh, to the left of uh, James Fortin's upper lip. So this is, gives you a, a sense of what the, some of the work that the conservators were doing uh, to prepare this and, and make it ready for, for uh, public display. Um, the, uh, this portrait of William Lloyd Garrison, uh, which is a uh, lithograph based on a portrait that was done by Robert Douglas uh, Jr. Uh, it's in the collection of the Historical Society. Uh, Rock William Lloyd Garrison was uh, again, separated by James, from James Fortin by a generation, but became friends, quite good friends with him and active correspondence with, with, uh, with James Fortin. So much so that the largest grouping of James Fortin's writings is in the Boston Public Library in the William Lloyd Garrison papers. Uh, 
Um, James Fortin was an early financial backer of the Liberator newspaper. And in the 1830s, Garrison was, anytime he came down to Philadelphia, he would go to the Fortin family home on Lombard Street. That was usually his first stop he would make is go visit with the Fortin family. He was uh, corresponding with James Fortin quite frequently, uh, comparing notes about events of the day, uh, news, um, and uh, Fortin and Garrison really became uh, good friends. Another good friend of uh, Paul Cuffey, uh, of James Fortin was Paul Cuffey, uh, uh, and older than James Fortin, but also a wealthy black entrepreneur of the early 19th century. Uh, Cuffey was uh, based in Massachusetts. He was a ship owner uh, uh, and merchant, owned a, a, a merchant ship called the uh, Traveler. James Fortin repaired and made sales for that ship. Uh, but this really wonderful silhouette is a rare example of a portrait of, of Cuffey uh, that's uh, here in the collection of the Historical Society. Perhaps uh, this uh, silhouette was uh, done uh, by, uh, 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 in the studio of the, the Peel family, perhaps even by Moses Williams, uh, uh, as cutting this silhouette. Uh, Francis Johnson, another contemporary of James Fortin, we borrowed his portrait, uh, this, this printed portrait of him from the Historical Society. Francis Johnson was a neighbor and, and friend of the Fortins, but Johnson was the first uh, published uh, African-American musician. And um, in order to bring his music to life in this exhibit, we commissioned recordings uh, of, of his work uh, to give you a sense, give visitors a sense of the range of instrumentation that Johnson was composing in. And we work with local uh, um, African-American uh, musicians and uh, also from a wider region. Uh, Candace Nicole Potts, a really talented vocalist who's actually based uh, in uh, Michigan. Uh, Stephen Page, uh, a talented pianist who's based here in Philadelphia. And B.E. Uh, Farrow, who is uh, based in Baltimore, plays uh, a really talented fiddle player and multi-instrumentalist. But uh, we commissioned recordings of Johnson's original compositions, and there's a listening station interactive in the exhibit where you get to hear these, uh, these compositions and uh, get a sense of the music that, um, the, uh, that Black Philadelphians are, lis are listening to uh, in the 1820s, 30s, uh, 40s. Uh, we borrowed uh, from the Historical Society uh, examples of Johnson's music, including the Butchers and Drovers Grand March, uh, and also a really uh, interesting receipt book for the uh, uh, major celebration that was had for the Marquis de Lafayette uh, in 1824 here in uh, Philadelphia. And uh, the receipt book notes that Francis Johnson provided musical entertainment for the ball for the Marquis during his, uh, as part of his tour of the United States, in eight, which began in 1824. On, on an adjacent page of that book, I always like to point out that Robert Bogle is, is listed there as providing the catering services, the food services for that event. Robert Bogle was a, uh, another uh, black entrepreneur uh, here in Philadelphia and um, a friend of the Fortins who is also uh, a philanthropist and a community leader uh, here in the city. One of the uh, pleasing uh, sort of, not quite a discovery, but realizations I had while I was doing research here at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania is that when I was looking for uh, printed uh, copies of James Fortin's earliest known letter, uh, which was written in January, 1800, I was trying to find printed, printed versions of it, but then I realized in the, in the catalog that you guys have the original here. Uh, the, the original manuscript is here in the uh, Historical Society's collection. And so uh, that is on view. This is James Fortin's earliest sur surviving letter written two years after he takes over the uh, sail loft. But uh, it's a, a letter that he writes to a Massachusetts congressman named George Thatcher. Uh, Thatcher uh, was serving in Congress at the time and was present for a, a really important vote in which Congress is voting whether or not they should hear a petition that was uh, delivered to Congress by a group of um, free black Philadelphians led by Absalom Jones that was petitioning Congress to either uh, uh, change or even uh, amend uh, and perhaps even repeal the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793, which President Washington had signed into law. But Congress voted to not hear the petition because the Congress 
did not consider African Americans citizens of the United States at that time. Congressman Thatcher, though, was the only congressman, congressman to vote to hear the petition. And that word got out about that. James Fortin writes Congressman Thatcher this letter praising him for that, that, uh, that vote. And this is a, a quote from the letter, though our faces are black, we all have the feelings and passions of men. James Fortin's trying to show that I too am a human being, I too am a citizen of the, of the United States and should be considered a citizen of this United States, a nation that Fortin himself helped to create and fought for and was a prisoner of war for uh, in 1781. James Fortin was al also shared his patriotism and philanthropy throughout his life. And this is one of my favorite kind of pairings and reunions uh, as a result of this work. On the, um, the right side of the screen is this really uh, massive piece of, of silver that was made here in Philadelphia, commissioned by the citizens of Philadelphia to celebrate the victory of Captain Isaac Hull and the USS Constitution, the first uh, vic great victory of the United States during the War of 1812. And uh, citizens of Philadelphia got together and put together a subscription to commission a piece of presentation silver that was gonna be made by the firm of Fletcher and Gardner at the corner of 4th and Chestnut Streets. Uh, and um, this urn, which still survives in the, collect in the collection of uh, a dis direct descendant of Captain Hull, um, the urn is truly impressive. It's on display in the exhibit, but just below it is the original subscription list from the Historical Society uh, of Pennsylvania's collection. And when you examine the, the, the hundreds of names on this subscription list, some people are giving $10, $5, $20. And if you look closely, James Fortin's name is there, having paid $10 to support this, this presentation, uh, Silver. So this is reu reuniting the subscription list with the, the urn that it that led to, to its creation. Um, and uh, really, really need to bring this, this back together. And from our analysis of the list, James Fortin seems to be the only person of African descent on this list as a, as a contributor, which is, a, which is interesting uh, to, to think about. Um, but one of the... Uh, uh, most important places in James Fortin's uh, uh, life experience, and it's a perfect time that art, so, uh, art, art shows up, uh, uh, is the African Episcopal Church of St. Thomas. You, plan, you timed that, that art. Uh, but uh, uh, the African Episcopal Church of St. Thomas, uh, founded in, in the 1790s, uh, lo originally located on, on Fifth Street. It's a congregation that still uh, is thriving today. Uh, here in Philadelphia, but James Fortin was an early leader of this of this church. Um, the he was part of the, the the vestry or the lay leadership of the church, and this is the earliest surviving image of the the church edifice, the the, the building on Fifth Street, uh, and uh, really wonderful uh, lithograph from the society's collection. Uh, one of the other interesting prints that we borrowed from the Historical Society is, is this one here that was likely made and printed in New York in the 1840s, following a series of events that really rocked Philadelphia. These events included uh, racial violence, uh, ethnic violence. So this is um, uh, violence that pitted uh, recent immigrants to Philadelphia, uh, against the Philadelphia, Philadelphia's uh, African American population, it's Irish Catholics fighting Irish Protestants in, in the city. But a, uh, from a New Yorker's perspective, they, this, the artist creates a view in the city of brotherly love, and it just shows this chaotic scene of interracial violence at the center. But then, if you look uh, just to the um, right side, towards the back, you see Pennsylvania Hall notated on one of the buildings. That's a reference to the 1838 uh, burning of Pennsylvania Hall, uh, a, a um, uh, building that the Fortin family helped to uh, pay for and, and construct. Uh, it was supposed to be a uh, meeting place for like-minded reformers, a safe place for meetings. And just four days after its initial meetings, uh, the uh, Pennsylvania Hall was attacked and burned to the ground. Uh, the charred remnants of it were, were, were left up uh, and when you look at the minutes of the uh, uh, female, uh, uh, the uh, female abolition society 
uh, here in Philadelphia, whose minutes are here at the Historical Society. James Fortin's uh, wife was a member, his daughters were members. Uh, they write about their experience of dealing with this, this moment and the aftermath of it. And what they say is, now is not the time to retreat, rather we need to redouble our efforts in, in our reform, our efforts to reform the United States and further uh, encourage the nation to commit to its uh, founding ideals. And so uh, another key member of the Fortin family is James Fortin's son-in-law, Robert Purvis. And Purvis um, was, not, was originally from South Carolina, but his uh, experience, uh, 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 you know, childhood experience, his parents moved up to Philadelphia and um, Fortin, uh, Purvis became established here. He, was, uh, his, he inherited wealth from his father who was white, his mother was a woman of African descent. Uh, James Fortin's, uh, Fortin befriended the Purvis family. Robert Purvis began to look up to James Fortin as a father figure and a role model. And Robert Purvis actually married James Fortin's daughter, Harriet uh, Davy Fortin. And together the Fortins and the Purvis uh, family uh, are using their wealth to channel it into efforts that are supporting the free black community in Philadelphia, but also um, enslaved people who are seeking freedom uh, beyond uh, Pennsylvania. And that one of the uh, most noteworthy uh, outlets of that is the Philadelphia Vigilant Association, whose records are here at the Historical Society. Robert Purvis often served as the president of that society. And this is an early version, organized version of the Underground Railroad in which freedom seekers coming from Virginia, the Carolinas, Maryland, coming up to Philadelphia, and they're secretly being given uh, shelter, clothing, um, food, and money and transportation to go further north towards New York, Boston, even up to Canada. And so when you look through the records of the Philadelphia Vigilant Association, you see ledger pages where it says, a uh, woman from Virginia, dark complexion given $5 and sent with an agent to New York or family from Maryland with uh, descript brief descriptions of them. They're not, names are not being used because this is all meant to be secret. Uh, and uh, also the agents that are helping them are meant to be secret, but some of those agents were likely members of the Fortin family and their contemporaries. Uh, freedom seekers are, are receiving shelter in the Fortin family home on Lombard Street and Purvis's home on, on Lombard Street. Um, it's a really incredible uh, uh, grouping of, of records that we, it was really an honor to be able to display this at the, at the museum. And this is pre-William Still. William Still would go on in the 1850s alongside Robert Purvis to reform the Vigilant Association and expand its operations. Uh, and, and William Still uh, you know, is, is what they consider the father of the, of the Underground Railroad. And his records uh, that are uh, here, I think some of them are gonna be on, on view tonight perhaps, um, here in the room, are, 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 are treasures part of the collection here. Uh, one of the, another one of the aspects of this exhibit that we, uh, let's see if I can advance the slide here. There it goes. Um, is building out the Fortin family tree. I know uh, a number of you are interested in genealogy, genealogy work. And this is something I engaged uh, uh, Julie Winch uh, with. Uh, she and I were working on building out the Fortin family tree a bit more uh, based on Julie's work that she did in advance of A Gentleman of Color, which was published now 20 years ago in 2003. Hard to, hard to believe that. But um, uh, so Julie and I spent a lot of time on, on ancestry, on family search, uh, and we're filling out the Fortin family tree. So James Fortin and Charlotte Fortin have um, nine children, eight of whom survived to adulthood. Four of those children have children of their own. So that's that grandchild, uh, grandchildren generation uh, in, in orange on screen here. But what Julie and I were trying to do is pull those threads and build out that tree even further and bringing up to present day. And we were quite successful at doing that and made contact with living descendants of the Fortin family across the country. And they, those stars that you see on the map of the United States here mark out where, where those descendants are today. Uh, the uh, purple stars point out uh, descend, living descendants who lent objects to the exhibition. So you can see Arizona, you see Georgia, you see Illinois represented. Uh, not only did some of these uh, living descendants 
send objects uh, to on loan to the exhibit, but many of them have come to see the exhibit. We're there for the opening events back in February of 2023. And to uh, show you this table that you saw earlier on screen, this is one of those objects that's on loan from a step descendant of James Fortin. Who's his, this gentleman uh, is, lives in Arizona now. His uh, grandmother married a direct descendant of James Fortin, John Loring Roby, and who had moved out to California. And um, John Loring Roby had inherited items from uh, the Robert Purvis, Harriet Fortin Purvis branch of the family. And these, uh, this object, this table specifically, and objects I'm gonna share on screen coming up, have been passed down through six, now seven generations of the Fortin family. This table was likely made here in Philadelphia, perhaps in the 1790s or the first decade of the 1800s. Uh, according to the Fortin family, this is a table that James Fortin owned that he had purchased to furnish his home that he used as a, as a uh, table in the house on Lombard Street uh, when he purchased it in 1805. Uh, and, uh, the stories that this table could tell, the people that were meeting around it, people like William Lloyd Garrison were probably sitting across this table with, with uh, James Fortin, Legis Pennsylvania legislators, members of the uh, black community in the city, people like William Whipper, Francis Johnson may have been sitting at this table uh, meeting with James Fortin. But on top of that, the uh, gentleman in Arizona whose step descendant also inherited two needlework samplers stitched by James Fortin's daughters, uh, Margareta Fortin on the left, Mary Fortin on the right. The first one is stitched in 1817, the other in 1822. And these uh, samplers in the table never have left the family. They've never been on view before. They've never been um, studied by historians until this exhibit. Uh, so this is really uh, you know, amazing uh, additions to our understanding of Philadelphia's uh, black community in the early 19th century. And we sponsored the conservation of these samplers. This gives you a, a view of Margareta Fortin's sampler. So it's the front and the back of the sampler. You can see the, the vibrancy of the, the threads, the, the stitching that Margareta Fortin added when she was uh, a, a child uh, as part of her education. Uh, and uh, really gives you a sense of, of the, 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 the visual impact that this, this made. Um, on loan from a different branch uh, of the uh, uh, family is um, actually a, also connect, a branch connected to Robert Purvis, but uh, a, a different uh, generation. Uh, this box belonged to Robert Purvis, probably uh, held some of his documents, uh, but this has been passed down through the family as well. It, it, you know, until it was, went on display in Black Founders, it was in uh, this uh, Purvis descendant's living room as just part of the part of the furniture. But it has a really nightly, nicely engraved plate on it with Robert Purvis's name. Uh, really, a, an amazing um, item connected to to Robert Purvis. And one of the, the, the friends that I've I've been able to friendships that I've been able to develop as a result of this exhibit is with uh, Atwood Kip Fortin Jacobs, who is James Fortin's great 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 grandson. He was born here in Philadelphia, uh, but now uh, lives in Illinois. And he has been the, the steward for much of his adult life of the Fortin family Bible. Now, this Bible was uh, presented to uh, James Fortin's daughter-in-law, Jane Vogelzang Fortin, on her, the uh, uh, occasion of her marriage to James Fortin Jr. That marriage took place up in New York City uh, at the uh, African Episcopal Church of St. Philip. Um, and the first uh, 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 black church in black Episcopal church in uh, in um, New York City, and uh, the Bible itself not only has religious importance but it also has genealogical importance to the family because uh, generations of the Fortin family from 1839 to the present day have added births, deaths, and marriages, uh, uh, records of those to the family record pages of the Bible. Uh, the most recent uh, addition to this is from 1995, and that's Kip's daughter, Taylor, born in 1995 out, out in Illinois. But uh, Kip shares a story that he was sort of scared and reluctant to, to pen her name into the record pages, but uh, he finally uh, um, uh, got the courage to do it 
because he was saying that the penmanship on the left side of the page was much better than his own. So fun, fun, fun story in that regard. But um, this has received quite a bit of attention, including a uh, uh, recent article in the Philadelphia Inquirer. And then um, for a, a program as part of our Read the Revolution speaker series, series uh, this past spring, Kip and his daughter Taylor came to the Museum of the American Revolution and joined on stage uh, Julie Winch to reflect upon the 20th anniversary of the publication of, of A Gentleman of Color, uh, which had a unique connection to Kip and Taylor uh, in terms of their uh, growth together as, as parent and child. Because when Kip um, was helping Taylor with a school project in the uh, early 2000s, uh, 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 Kip was saying to Taylor that, hey, we're related to this guy named James Fortin, but we don't know too much about him. Why don't we go to the local library and see what we can find? And what they find is a gentleman of color on the shelves of the, the shelves of the library in the stacks. And they said they just about fell on the floor. They got they were able to get in touch with, with Julie Winch and that relationship built from there. And then we were able to get with Julie's help getting back in touch with, with Kip. And he not only uh, and he and Taylor not only decided to lend the Bible to the exhibition, but they've actually decided to donate the Bible to the Museum of the American Revolution's collection. Uh, and so thank you very much for joining me uh, today, this uh, afternoon to hear about the exhibition. And um, I'd be happy to address questions that you have. And uh, I think James Fortin would be a Phillies fan. So go, go Phillies. So. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Thank you so much for that um, look at the exhibition, as well as a look at the objects that come from the Historical Society and other uh, repositories. Do we have any questions in the room? We have to hand you the mic so they can hear you at home. Hi, Matt. Hi. I was looking at that portrait again in new ways, and it occurred to me before you mentioned um, Moses Williams that it reminds me of Moses Williams' yeah. silhouettes. So I just quickly Googled Moses Williams died. He was only 48. He died at, in, in 1825. Is it possible that, that that painting is based on a silhouette by Moses Williams? Or if not, did that, did that painter use a fignognotrace to do that and then paint it in? That, that, those are all th theories that yeah, we, I was talking with David bringing about this uh, relatively recently. That, that, those are plausible um, explanations. And physiognotrace is a, a very plausible um, um, way of producing a, a portrait like this. And so this is this portrait connected to the, the Peel circle? Possibility. Yeah, very, very much a possibility. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. OK, any other questions? I'm a staff member, but I have a question okay. and also a comment that um, print of St. Thomas um, Episcopal Church here in Philadelphia. I was looking for that one day and I found out that it was on loan to you. <laughs> so <laughs> was, I had a moment there. It was a little was like, yeah, yeah, it's happened a lot. There's a yeah. lot of stuff there. Yeah. Um, uh, I, as you talked about, there's a lot of documents from our collection, but also from the library company and from Boston Public Library and all over the place. And how do you take this narrative and weave that together when there is no centralized foreign family papers in one place? That's yeah, that's a great question. And that's why we incorporated that map that gives you the geographic range of where these loans came from to create this exhibition. Because you're right, there is not one central place to study uh, the the Fortin family story, uh, but it has to be uh, pieced together, um, which involves a lot of work. You know, to you can't just go into one place. Um, and with any project, any research project, you really just can't go to one place to study something. But um, you have to go to a pretty wide range of, of places to study, and you get a sense of that when you look at the footnotes of Julie Winch's book. Um, but even to, to bring these materials together, uh, it, it involved a lot of relationship building, um, you know, face to face meetings, going out to Arizona, going out to Illinois, um, and um, our board at the museum, the sponsors of the exhibition, that some of that work was what uh, encouraged them to throw their hat 
kind of in, in the ring to support an exhibit like this because it's bringing new um, new uh, scholarship, but also new um, uh, concepts like uh, a reunion of the urn and the and the subscription list or bringing objects that have never been on public view before out into public view. Um, and so it was, it was pretty appealing in that regard to uh, people that were hearing the, about the early stages of the exhibition. exhibition. So, yeah. We have a follow-up question on Zoom about tracking things down, uh, as you were just saying. And then also I'm curious, as a curator, um, does, the, does the story come out of the documents you have found or did you have a narrative you wanted to tell and you chased down the documents and objects? Yeah. Because this is a gorgeous marrying of <laughs> objects and, and documents. Um, and you chased down the things you needed. A little bit of both. Some of the things we didn't expect to find, like, you know, just for example, the, the Fortin family items that are on loan from descendants, we did not know about them before we thought we wanted to do this exhibit. That was as part of the process of uh, creating the exhibit. So that is an example of where we need to now work this in, this sort of changes our perspective a little bit and work it into the storyline. Um, whereas in other cases, we knew we had a story that we wanted to tell, what are we gonna, what documents, what objects are we gonna choose to tell that story? You know, one of my favorite uh, loans for the exhibit that I didn't show on screen is a pew from uh, the collection at the Richard Allen Museum at, at Mother Bethlehem E Church. Uh, this pew was likely used and, and sat in for the uh, 1817 meeting of the uh, of Philadelphia's black community that meets at, uh, at the church that James Fortin presides over and uh, discusses the concept of colonization and whether uh, Philadelphians should support this effort, uh, not support it, um, an, an, an effort that James Fortin and Paul Cuffey were initially supportive of, but uh, they're, they're James Fortin's uh, idea of it changes quite rapidly soon after. But that kind of object, I didn't know that survived and, uh, when I was thinking about that, that moment, but then, oh, we gotta have that, it's sort of like a witness object to that moment. People literally sitting in this very, uh, very uh, pew, hearing those words, being present for that moment, uh, as some um, uh, people called it the spirit of 1817. Um, that kind of things just kind of gives you the chills when you think about about that. So. so were there items that you identified that you were not successful in acquiring for the exhibit? And then on some random day, did someone walk in and tap you on the shoulder and say, oh, I wish I had known about this exhibit because I have. The, the that's a great question. The, the second part hasn't happened yet. Uh, maybe it will. <laughs> um, but the first part, this is not to disparage the Boston Public Library, but we did not borrow anything from the Boston Public Library. We asked, but just due to their schedules, their projects that they were working on, we were not able to borrow original materials from them. Um, it was disappointing to not be able to show some of those letters um, that Fortin was writing, um, the original photograph, the daguerreotype of, um, or is it, is it tin, maybe it's a tintype of uh, Robert Purvis um, that's in their collection, but we were able to incorporate images, you know, high resolution images of them. It would have been nice to display the originals though. So, yeah. <laughs> Did Kip, no, when he had his great, great, great grandfather's Bible, did he know about the Fortin exhibit? And then he contacted you and said, oh, I have my great, great, great grandfather's Bible. Good question. Uh, what the way that happened was um, back in 2005, six, that's when Kip and his and daughter Taylor were working on that project and they encountered Julie Winch's book. So they were at that point, they were able to get in touch with Julie Winch and they struck up a conversation. And so Julie knew that this Bible existed, but she hadn't seen it before. And so, but she then uh, between 2006 and 2021, um, she lost touch with uh, Kip. So I hopped on Google 
and said, Kip, that's a yeah, Atwood, Kip, Fort, and Jacobs. It's kind of a, not the, it's not John Smith, you know? So um, I tried to track down a possible ad mailing address for, for Kip. And I was, uh, so I found one that was plausible based on the details that Julie shared. I wrote a letter to Kip and said, we're working on this project. We'd love to share with you about it, talk with you about it. Kip wrote back. It was successful. Yeah, that, le that letter was very, it was very successful. And then I went out to Illinois to visit with Kip and, and uh, uh, have lunch with him. And, and, um, and then um, that led to the loan and then the, the donation. And one of the things we're really proud about with the donation is that written into the deed of gift is the ability for descendants of that branch of the Fortin family to continue to update the family record pages. So it's a living uh, artifact in that way. So, you know, if, if Taylor gets married or has children of her own, uh, or you know, when Kip passes away, you know, that, that, that information can be added to, to those pages. Um, we have two questions on Zoom, and then I'll get back to the room. Uh, one was a particular um, Fortin question about his business that descends to his sons, and yeah. then they sell it. Is that true? That's right. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, to whom do you know? One of their one of their uh, black employees, actually. I think his name is Charles Anthony. Uh, uh, I think it was Charles Anthony is his name. Um, but yeah, the Fortins, uh, Robert Bridges Fortin and James Fortin Jr. Uh, really kind of struggled to keep the business afloat uh, when they're, after their father dies in 1842. Financial panics, trying to call in debts, left the family in a tough situation uh, financially. And uh, so the business only remains uh, in Fortin hands for a few more years, uh, but then it's sold. And so the, the Fortin family is not in the sale making business uh, um, a few years after Fortin's death. And then the other question from Zoom was about the title Black Founders mm -hmm. and um, the fact that uh, James Fortin is present at the revolution, fights in the revolution. Yeah. Um, were there other African-American families, stories that we could tell? Who would be the next exhibition you would want to oh, do? And of course, yeah. founding is not only 1776. Yeah. I mean, you take it into the 19th century to really you know, forward the story of the founding of the country. So tell us why James Fortin emerged and who's next. Right, well, Fortin's story was pretty compelling, that, that revolutionary war service, a business leadership, the, um, but then the multi-generational uh, reform efforts um, and the founders is not only founding era, that sort of thing, but founding um, organizations that are engaged in this reform work, like um, the Philadelphia Female Anti-Slavery Society, like their involvement in the founding of the American Anti-Slavery Society um, and other, other, other groups like that, but um, also promoting the founding ideals of the nation, right? Uh, encouraging the nation to further adhere to those ideals and the, the concept of all men are created equal. Uh, but the Fortins are not alone in doing this work. Um, the, uh, but it's, who is the next exhibit? That's, that's a good question. I'm gonna have to think about that some William more. Still. Yeah, but yeah, Maybe there, William there still. Are, there's, there's other stories that uh, really deserve to be told. Um, and I, I really like William Whipper's story quite a bit. Stephen Smith is another person that comes to mind. He's a slightly, uh, uh, you know, one generation after Fortin, but leaves an indelible mark on the black community here in Philadelphia. So that's somebody I'd, I'd be interested in, in, in learning more about too. Thanks for taking that question. Yeah. Matt, two unrelated uh, questions um, or not closely related. Um, one of the things that I found remarkable in the exhibition were the records of black soldiers. Um, so maybe you could just comment on that collection and how it came uh, to you. And secondly, um, in the present moment, your map showed uh, loans from Fortin descendants around the country. I'm curious to know if the exhibition brought branches of the family together who had been out of touch for generations. Great, great questions. Uh, so uh, what David is referring to is the Patriots of Color archive that the Museum of the American Revolution acquired 
um, just uh, as this exhibit is being developed. And it's about, it's a collection of about 200 uh, documents uh, from that, that document the uh, military service of uh, black and native American soldiers in the ranks of the Continental Army. Uh, and this collection was amassed by a private collector uh, who then decided to sell his collection. He had been collecting this over a period of decades, uh, one document at, at a time and decided to, to sell it. Uh, and so the museum acquired this, it documents the names uh, and service of about 160 some individual soldiers of, uh, of uh, Native American and, uh, and African descent. And uh, the museum is working closely with Ancestry.com to have a grouping of these records digitized and publicly uh, accessible in that way. And then we're also thinking of other digital projects to bring out the, these stories. So these documents include pay lists, muster rolls, uh, certifications of service, uh, those sorts of things. Um, but really an incredible uh, collection. And then uh, your second question about bringing descendants together. Yeah, th that, that did happen. Generations uh, who were separated by geography, who had not encountered each other before, were completely unaware, were brought together. Example of that, there is a big grouping of the uh, Roby family that's in the Bay Area in California. About 12 of them came to the opening of the exhibition. They uh, are now in touch with Kip Fortin Jacobs, their distant cousin. Um, and what's interesting about the Fortin family is that there are living descendants of James Fortin who identify as white and others who identify as uh, black. And uh, they all knew that they were related to James Fortin in some way, but they're all very proud of this exhibition and this story uh, being shared more widely. Another example of, of this is um, when Kip uh, uh, visited uh, the Museum of the American Revolution for the first time last fall. Uh, he, we were able to take him out to Lawnside, New Jersey, uh, a uh, uh, municipality in Camden County that was the first uh, Black-led municipality uh, in New Jersey. Uh, and still a uh, predominantly African-American or good, good portion Af African-American community. And Dolly Marshall is a local uh, historian there. Uh, and Kip's, some of Kip's great grandfathers are, are buried in uh, one of the cemeteries there. And Dolly is a collateral descendant of James Fortin because her great, great aunt married George H. Fortin, who was one of the town leaders of Lawnside, helped establish it. George H. Fortin, obviously direct descendant of James Fortin. So Dolly's ancestors are in that Bible, in the family record pages, but she had no idea that that Bible existed. So we, so Dolly came with Kip, they had a little reunion, we all videoed, uh, and um, she got to see the Bible for the first time and have that experience of seeing her, her, um, her ancestors' names there recorded. And some of those records, that's the only place that those records survive, is, is written in that Bible. Thank you very much again. Thank you again. Thank you, Matt, for your time. I just want to shout out that Matt is also one of the uh, authors in our new publication that will be available very shortly called 200 Years. We, uh, I said, we're celebrating our 200th birthday next year. And he has an essay, uh, one of 100 essays featuring um, 100 different objects from our collection. So again, thank you for your work today and for your work on the exhibit. And thank you to all of you for being here, um, especially our MOAR members and our HSP members. We function because of your support. So thank you for coming out and joining us. And also our library is open for you to do research in. You, like Matt, can come and discover your family, discover your block, discover your community here at HSP. Get onto our mailing list. Uh, we're gonna put the, um, the link in the chat, it's hsp.org slash enews, and join us uh, for all of our upcoming programs. October 24th is when we launch this and our programming for next year. So thank you so much for joining us. <laughs>